Later, Pluto. Prepare for landing. When I was growing up, there were nine planets in the solar system. Until one day, that number dropped to eight. Pluto had been demoted from planethood. And I took that personally. I think a lot of other people did too. That is why I've come all the way out here to the edge of the solar system to prove once and for all that Pluto is a planet. Nico. What's up, Brian? Do you think Pluto is a planet? No. No? This video is not going to a good start here. Is Pluto a planet? I believe so, yeah. Yep, that's what they taught me in science class. Yes or no? Is Pluto a planet? I wanna say no. Probably. Probably. But I guess all these scientists are telling us it's not anymore. It looks like a planet. It's got atmosphere. It even has a heart, unlike you. Neil doesn't know what he's talking about. Of course it's a planet. Pluto is 100% a planet. I don't care what any science guys say. If Pluto's not a planet, then what is a planet? I just learned all the planets and I was really proud of myself. I remember talking to my mom and telling her all the planets I knew and then I went to school the next day. Suddenly Pluto's not a planet? Pluto's a planet and I think I'm right. Is Pluto a planet? No. Pluto may not have been discovered until 1930, but astronomers already knew it had to be there thanks to math. Good old math. You see, Neptune's orbit was behaving a little uh, unexpectedly, so it was theorized that an object dubbed Planet X had to be tugging on it. Elizabeth Williams, an astronomer mostly forgotten by history, unfortunately, calculated where it must be, and so then 15 years later, Clyde Tombaugh finally found it. People were so hyped that Walt Disney even changed the name of Mickey Mouse's dog. Amazingly, there was no way for them to know that we'd someday discover a striking resemblance between them. <laughs> These incredible high-res photos were taken in 2015 by the New Horizons Space Probe. A team of Pluto fans spent five years preparing the mission and then another nine years waiting for it to arrive. But just months after New Horizons launched into space, Pluto fans were greeted with a nasty surprise. Pluto had been unceremoniously stripped of its planethood. How dare they? I mean, my very educated mother just served us nine pizzas. What's she supposed to serve us now, ninjas? In 2006, the IAU redefined what makes a planet a planet by using three criteria. It needs to orbit a star, it needs to be spherical in shape, and it needs to have cleared its cosmic neighborhood. And we'll go through all three of these throughout the rest of this video. Oh, well then this should be easy. I mean, Pluto goes around the sun, check. Although sure, its orbit might be a little drunk. Yeah, now it's a party. It's also so off center that sometimes Pluto is closer to the sun than Neptune, but hey, still counts. What's interesting about this first criteria is that it has nothing to do with size. I mean, Callisto, Io, and Europa are all bigger than Pluto, but they don't orbit the sun. They orbit Jupiter, making them moons, not planets. Yeah, moons are the sort of things you could find around planets. Pluto's got five of them, just saying. But having moons is not a criteria for planethood. Most of Pluto's moons are pretty small too, except for Charon. Karen? Sharon? Charon? 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 I'm so sorry. I'm getting. I'll, I'll get back to the video. Charon, which is actually the largest moon in the solar system relative to the body it orbits. Charon is almost half the size of Pluto. In fact, they're close enough in size that Pluto kind of orbits Charon back. Think of it like the Olympic hammer throw. Even though these dudes are massive, the ball they're swinging around is heavy enough that they both actually spin around a point between them. And the same thing happens between Pluto and Charon, as you can see with this scale model right here. Pluto actually orbits a point outside of its own body, called the barycenter, where I'm standing. The location of this point is determined by the ratio of mass between the two orbiting bodies, and in the case of Pluto, that's about 1,300 kilometers off of its surface. But if the mass of these two bodies were the same, then the barycenter would sit in a point perfectly in the middle between them. Wait, okay, so if Pluto and Charon are orbiting each other, then is Pluto not orbiting the sun? Oh wait, yeah, no, this happens with Earth and our moon too. You see, the Earth doesn't just rotate in place like this. It actually orbits around a berry center about a thousand miles under your feet right now. That's about three quarters from the center of the Earth. Most people don't realize it, but Earth wobbles too. It's just that in the case of Pluto, that wobble is so extreme that it's sometimes considered to be a binary system orbiting the sun. Orbiting the sun, so it still counts, still counts. 
Speaking of the sun though, am I the only one who thought it would be darker here? I always envisioned Pluto as being too far from the sun to get enough light to see. In reality though, it's about as bright as those first few minutes after sunset called civil twilight. That's enough to read a book, or even burn your eyes if you look right at it. Kinda looks like a welding arc. Although at this distance, something the sun does not provide much of is heat, cause boy is it cold! Naturally, Antarctica holds the record for the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth at negative 90 degrees Celsius. But that's nothing compared to how cold liquid nitrogen is, which is even 100 degrees colder. But at negative 230 degrees Celsius, Pluto is cold enough that nitrogen freezes solid. Look at this, I'm standing on nitrogen ice. In fact, 98% of Pluto's surface is frozen nitrogen, including the giant heart-shaped basin called Sputnik Planitia. It's believed that a massive impact event billions of years ago left it as a permanent scar which is still geologically active today. These are called convection cells, where warm ice gets pushed up from below as the cold ice slips back down every 500,000 years, making this a lot like a cosmic lava lamp that's cradled by massive mountains. Except on Pluto, rock isn't actually rock, it's water. These mountains might be as big as the Rockies back home, but they're made entirely out of icy H2O. It is so cold here that nitrogen acts like water ice and the water acts like granite. What's even more amazing is that scientists believe there is a giant ocean of liquid H2O water entirely below the crust of Pluto. Yeah, the magma inside of Pluto is just liquid water, just like how the magma inside of Earth is liquid rock. There are even freaking volcanoes here cryovolcanoes. Pluto's surprisingly Earth-like, except everything's like an octave colder, if that makes sense. Cool, so what's the deal with all the red stuff? Oh, oh, this is really cool. They're called tholins. Pluto has a surprisingly large atmosphere, mostly nitrogen that is sublimated off the ground, but there's some methane in it too, and methane undergoes a transformation when bombarded by cosmic rays from the sun. It breaks it down and then recombines it into complex hydrocarbons, which then fall to the ground like red snow. That's why Pluto has such striking red landscapes. And we can see similar areas on other worlds like Europa. It's even hypothesized that tholins are what make Jupiter's big red spot, well, red. Uh, then what exactly is this stuff? Is it special? Stick with me for a moment because I'm getting to something incredible. Yes, tholins are special because they're composed of things like amino acids and nucleotides, which are the building blocks for protein and DNA. Tholins are literally the ingredients for life itself. But that is not the incredible part. Check out where the tholin deposits are deepest and these names. There's the Cthulhu region, the Morgoth region, and the Balrog region. Seriously, shout out to the naming committee. These names are awesome. There's even a Tholin deposit on Sharon called Mordor. <gasps> Mordor! That means there's an actual real place in the solar system containing the ingredients for life, and its name is Mordor. Mordor! Incredible. Although I wonder if that has anything to do with it being a planet. It has absolutely nothing to do with being a planet. Sorry, I just got distracted by how cool Pluto is. Anyway, where was I? The second criteria for planethood is that a planet's mass must be large enough that its own gravitational forces overcome the strength of the materials making it up, forcing it into nature's most efficient shape, a sphere. Oh, come on, did you think I wasn't gonna have a tennis ball in this video? I'm so sorry. Now Pluto is obviously big enough to be spherical, but how big is big enough? At almost 2,400 kilometers in diameter, Pluto is half the width of the United States. And Sputnik Planitia, how big is that? It's the size of Texas, Mr. President. Thanks, Mr. Graham Norton. It would take longer to fly from Seattle to Tokyo than it would to fly all the way around Pluto. Wait, did I say Graham Norton? <laughs> Billy Bob Thornton. I said Edward Norton? You said Graham, Graham Norton. Norton! God dang it! That is significantly smaller than our own moon, but is still significantly bigger than Charon, which is also still round. I mean, what is the threshold for roundness? Your mom? <laughs> The minimum size required to become spherical depends on a few things like density of the material. For objects mostly made of rock, that's about 600 kilometers in diameter. Pluto, which is mostly ice, is less dense than Earth, meaning it would still be spherical at just 400 kilometers across. Also, Pluto is more spherical than Earth. So not only does Pluto meet the second criteria, it passes with a perfect score. All right, that's what I'm talking about, yeah! Oh yeah, I almost forgot. The gravity on Pluto is just 6% that of Earth, meaning that I can jump 17 times higher here 
than back home. Can you imagine playing basketball like this? I mean, Michael Jackson's 46 inch vertical would be 63 feet here. Not even his arm can get that long. <sighs> All right, bring it on. What's the third criteria? <sighs> About that. It must be big enough that its own gravity cleared away any other objects of similar size near its orbit around the sun. Huh? Okay, this one requires a little bit of unpacking, so to understand it, let's look at Ceres. It's round, it orbits the sun, but it does so in the asteroid belt, so it's got a lot of neighbors. Even though it's almost a thousand kilometers in diameter, it doesn't have enough gravity to deflect, capture, or merge with all of the other objects in the asteroid belt, so Ceres can't be a planet. Which brings us back to Pluto, because the problem is that Pluto lives in the Kuiper belt. Surprise! We have another asteroid belt in the solar system. But this donut-shaped belt is out beyond the orbit of Neptune and is home to hundreds of thousands of objects, many of which are similar in size to Pluto. In fact, it was the discovery of Eris in 2005 that became the catalyst for all of this reclassification. Not only is Eris almost exactly the same size as Pluto, it's 30% heavier and lives in the same neighborhood. Although, to be fair, its orbit is a lot more drunk than Pluto's. Still counts. If Pluto is a planet, then Eris would be too. So would Ceres, so would Orcus, Celestia, Quar, Makimaki, Gong Gong. The list goes on. If these were all planets, how would we even remember them? Many very educated children may just surrender upon numbering planets on school quizzes moronically given every semester. Ah, ah. That's too many. And that's not all. We can't make Pluto a planet without including 87 other objects, some of which don't even have names yet. I failed. Uh, I'm sorry, Pluto fans. Pluto can't be a planet. Pluto can't be a planet. Unless I make it one. Wait, what? So all Pluto needs to do to become a planet is just clear its neighborhood, right? Yeah, what are you doing? Clearing the neighborhood. I turned the whole Kuiper belt into Super Pluto. It is now officially a planet. But the Tholen fields are buried. The nitrogen glaciers are shattered. And the cryovolcanoes, they're gone. What have I done? Listen, it's okay to feel an emotional connection to Pluto. If you grew up with it as part of your celestial family, having to accept that change is, well, it's sad. But we focused on it for so long now that the most famous thing about Pluto isn't any of the amazing geology. The most famous thing about Pluto is that it's not a planet anymore. And that kind of makes me more sad because Pluto is such an amazing world full of incredible features, all of which have absolutely nothing to do with its status as a planet. So if Pluto is not a planet, then what is it? Well, it's a dwarf planet. Dwarf planet? Planet is still in the name? Yeah, planet has always been in the name. So it still counts? Uh, uh, yep, yeah, sure, still counts. It still counts! If you can find room in your heart to accept this wonderful little dwarf planet for what it is instead of what you want it to be, I have a feeling Pluto will accept you too. Thanks for watching.